let's run our first demonstration. First thing we're going to do is to uh, clear the server result cache so we have a clean slate to work with. And you can see that here. I'm calling the new package dbms result cache. Procedure is flush. And now I'll run a query to load the uh, result cache. And we can see that uh, this query does include the result cache hint. And it uh, is a simple query that groups by uh, a customer ID and a customer name and comes back with the sum of the sale amount and the number of purchases that the customer has made with us. You can see that the response time is, is uh, pretty good, uh, sub-second response time. And I just wanted to show you what was in the V$ result cache objects view. So I'm querying that. And you can see that there's a cache ID, which is the key of, of V$ result cache. Uh, right now, what we're seeing is the type, that we, the type of object is a result. And its status has been published. It's only using one block. Uh, the space consumed is uh, 316 bytes, so not very much. Um, I used the cache ID, by the way, that I, I, I got previously um, uh, in this script. So I ran the query again, and um, we went down to 0 0.07 of a second, where we started at 3 quarters of a second here at the top. So a pretty dramatic difference in response time. Now, I mentioned that the database maintains a um, dependency trail. So it, it has this cached result. But if my table, in this case the customers or the orders table, were to change, be updated, uh, the cached result would go from published to invalid. And I just wanted to show you a little bit about the V$ result cache dependency view. So. I get the ID from V$ result cache objects for the dependencies. And you can see that the dependencies have an ID as well, and they're related to an object number. And if you went to the DBA objects view, you could get the name of the object. Or more simply, you could just get the name of the objects from V$ result cache objects, because there's a relationship between these two tables. So you can see that clearly here that there is a dependency trail that is maintained in order to, to uh, uh, make the cache work. And if either orders table or the customer tables in the Dave schema were updated, then um, the uh, results would be marked invalid. Another query execution would simply recreate the, the, the cache. Okay. And I mentioned you could also go to user objects or DBA objects to get the names of your objects. Let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's, let's look at it from a tracing perspective. I'll use auto trace for, for today's demonstration. SQL trace would be a little bit better, but we'll just use it, this for simplicity's sake. First thing I did is run a very similar query, just to just to prime the the, the buffer cache, um, and we see our explain plan. Nothing too extraordinary here. Um, we should note the statistics. We're getting about 5,500 uh, logical IOs. You can also see there were, there was 5,500 physical IOs in this particular case, but you know that might go away. In fairness, that might go away in a subsequent run of the query anyway. But 5,500 logical IOs, as you can see right here, is uh, you know something we want to take a look at to get the 113 rows back. Uh, it took about 0.85 seconds to, to execute it. So let's let's cache enable this thing. Same query, but this time I'll use the result cache hint, and um, we're going to uh, see a difference in the explain plan. There's a new step, result cache, and this step says 
Either you're going to load the cache with results or you're going to use the cache. And um, the first time we run it, same thing, about 5,500 logical and physical IOs in order to get the 113 rows back. Execute the query again with the forward slash. Notice the, the elapsed time tr dropped to 0.06 from 0.85 of a second. Explain plan looks the same, as you would expect. And th there's the big upside. No physical or logical I.O. in order to return the result. 